Well, time to start our very last time domain transmission line topic. After this, we're still going to cover a few more transmission line topics, but we get into the sinusoidal excitation rather than logic signals, which is, of course, extremely important. In fact, back when I was in school, that was the only kind of transmission line I learned because the only circuits that went fast enough where you had to care about transmission line theory were RF circuits, you know, things that were modulated onto carriers. And then transmission lines uh, effects are always important. But today's topic is going to be coupling. on transmission lines. So let me draw for you a scenario and we'll talk about it. Where does this come from? Let's say I have a cross section of a printed circuit board. So it's coming out of the board. It had copper on two sides. I erased a lot of the copper on the top side to make circuit board traces. But the bottom side, the ground plane is intact. So I have a conductor there dielectric sandwich and then riding on top are maybe two transmission lines that are conductive traces, microstrips that run this way and they are in close proximity to one another. And of course it's epsilon r, mu sub r. Now we know from our physics 2 intuition and intuition that we will glean later in the class. When electrical signals like a voltage and a current propagate down this line, I am going to get fields. For example, if I have a voltage drop from here to here, I have E fields. On either side that surround my signal carrier. And likewise, when there's current on this, when the charges are moving back or forth, there's going to be a magnetic field that extends and decays outward as I move away from my conductive trace, but is never quite zero, even when I get over to this line, likewise the electric field. As a result, the electrical stuff that goes in on this line will influence what goes in over here. Both the electric and the magnetic field do that. Magnetic field is probably very easy to visualize because you know, it's an application of Faraday's law. If I send a current waveform down the first line, it's got a magnetic field that couples under, makes magnetic flux underneath this other uh, trace, this way, underneath this trace in the ground plane. And if there's a change in flux that excites an EMF or a voltage around the flux, that means there's going to be a voltage through here. And all of a sudden I have a signal that appears on my second transmission line, even if it's not even connected to a source. Hopefully it's not nearly as big as the first one. But it's a problem because it can make ghost signals on the transmission lines that I lay out on boards. So there are a couple things, and, and whenever you get ghost signals, that's called crosstalk. Let's put that in our notes. So coupling, the sharing of fields between transmission line leads to crosstalk. Unwanted signals that pop up on other lines unintended by the original circuit board designer. So, how do we model this? That's our next question. That's what we're going to approach. So you remember when I looked at transmission lines several weeks ago, we're first getting involved. We looked at a small sliver and came up with the circuit model to that and then chained a bunch of them together, let the limit of the sliver go to zero, and voila, out popped the telegrapher equations. I'm going to show you how to set this up for a coupled system. To actually solve it the way that we did and do all the math is way beyond the scope of this class. I really want to emphasize the fundamentals 
uh, and just how to recognize forward and backward crosstalk on a line. So I'll set up the model for you, and then I'll show you what the weakly coupled cases look like and how to calculate the forward and backwards crosstalk coefficients based on this, but I won't derive it. Uh, your book does plenty of that, so that's what textbooks are for. So let me show you the system that we're going like, to take a look at. So our circuit model is going to involve two transmission lines. I've actually grounded one of the uh, bars here. And I've actually grounded the top bar on the top model, so it's kind of flipped from what we normally do, but that's no big deal. I just do that to, so that you can interpret the more convenient circuit diagram that I'm about to draw. But again, we'll have a slight so sliver, delta Z. And we're going to model this entire system and as it, as it behaves together. And my equivalent circuit then becomes per unit length inductance, I'm going to call that L sub S. L sub S is per unit length inductance of a single line. That's where the S comes from units of Henry's per meter. So I've got a voltage on the output. This is going to be voltage as a function of Z plus delta Z. Over here, I've got the input voltage, which is just V sub 2 evaluated at Z. This is single capacitance, and I need to multiply both of these by delta Z because they're per unit length values. L sub S times delta D, delta Z, C sub S times delta Z, C sub S per unit length capacitance. of a single line, farads per meter. And my second line, I'm going to assume that it's symmetrical, so it has the same basic electrical parameters. Cs delta z is the per unit length capacitance for my delta z section. Ls delta z is that inductor value. And of course, I've got v1 as a function of z. And over here, my voltage is going to be V1, Z plus delta Z. And of course, all of these are functions of time as well, but I haven't shown that. Okay, so this just looks like two transmission lines connected together, but we're going to have two extra components now. C sub M delta Z where C sub M is the mutual capacitance in farads per meter. And likewise, this is going to operate like a little transformer coil. I'm going to have some mutual inductance, L sub M delta Z. And that's the basic model. That's how basically electrical uh, voltage and current 
can be excited in one in the second line, even if it's unexcited. If you just put a vo source here, you'll send some voltage and current down here. This is how you're smuggling some of that energy to the second line and causing crosstalk. If you make too much crosstalk, you will obliterate whatever information that you want to send on that other line. You corrupt your signal. You could c cause false logic level changes, uh, dropped bits if it's a communication symbol. <clears throat> So anyway, those are our single and mutual uh, circuit values. And I don't know if any spec sheet of transmission lines or anything that you'll measure uh, will actually report those values. You know, they're kind of useful circuit board parameter models uh, that we want to use for the system to understand how it works. But ultimately, crosstalk is measured with a couple of coefficients. I'll show you how to calculate those from the circuit parameters. This is the part where I skip the nasty derivation. So I'm going to do a substitution to simplify things, to simplify the mass, math. Substitution. I'm just going to call L my per unit length signal, single inductance. M is going to be my mutual inductance. The value C is going to be my single plus my mutual inductance. E is going to be my mutual capacitance. And the reason why I, I did it like this is because if you do it this way, all of your formulas using L and C are still valid. So velocity of propagation is going to be 1 over the square root of LC. The impedance of both lines is going to be the square root of L over C. And you can solve the telegrapher's equations nominally, at least, by treating waveforms as if they are propagating with this impedance and this velocity. Now, to get to the part where the crosstalk happens, we need to define another term here. If the lines... are embedded in a homogeneous medium and they're identical in geometry, which we've already assumed, then it turns out the ratio of your mutual inductance to your individual inductance, M to L, and your ratio of E to C are, sim are similar. They should be identical in the limit of a homogeneous medium. That means the same dielectric stuff is around your lines. Notice, however, that the uh, microstrip nominally violates that criterion because it's got dielectric material underneath the traces and air above. So this is only approximate for that. We're going to call that ratio delta. And in fact, delta is always a value between 0 and 1. 0 means no coupling. I only have, uh, if C sub M goes to 0, then I'm just left with C and L, 0 over L, 0 over C. I get no coupling. If this capital delta parameter is 1, then I get almost perfect coupling, super coupling. For realistic systems, we're usually operating somewhere over here. Delta is a small value, but it's not zero. You almost have to build lines that are right on top of each other to get this. And there are some times when you want to do that. Coupling is not, in this class we kind of treat it as if it's a bad phenomenon that you're trying to get rid of. And it most often is when you're dealing with digital logic and things. But um, um, there are times when you actually want to do it. You want to make couplers so that you can transfer energy from one transmission line to another. It's one way to make a splitter with relatively low loss. Bring two transmission lines together for a length on a circuit board or a pair of cables that are close together and intertwined. 
and you design the length and the coupling coefficient so that half of the signal jumps onto the other half of the line. And you've got a nice 3db coupler. In fact, I saw a great talk um, by uh, Professor Alenka Zavich over at uh, Computer Science uh, not too long ago where she had done some work to figure out how to get really high frequencies um, from one core to multiple cores within a chip. And so their substrate, their dielectric, was silicon, undoped silicon. And they had to put metal traces and a ground plane in. And she had designed a really interesting st structure that had intertwined connectors that was a super high delta. And this way, the output of one core, as it traveled down this line, could excite the signal on other transmission lines and make it to the other cores efficiently without reflection and in a small region of space. So there's a perfect example of somebody that was trying to use coupling, electromagnetic coupling, for their benefit. Uh, so lots of devices do that. But more often than not, at least when we're designing boards, this is the region that we're operating in, and this is the region we want to operate in, zero. OK. So now, let's get to the crosstalk coefficients. If we assume that we have a weakly coupled system, That is, delta is much less than 1. Then I can actually have two types of crosstalk. When I excite a signal on that second line, some of that signal could conceivably go one direction on the line, and that other signal, portion of that signal, may go in the other direction of the line. In other words, I, there's nothing to say that whatever voltage that I excite on that line is going to turn into only forward or only backwards propagating waves. It's probably going to split itself up. And so the way it splits itself up is as follows. We have a forward crosstalk coefficient. And that's going to be equal to the square root of LC over 2. The ratio of the mutual to single magnetic, uh, mutual to capacitance to single capacitance minus the mutual inductance to the single inductance. And we said that in a homogeneous medium, when you have uh, uh, identical transmission line geometries, this ratio is about equal to this ratio. So ideally, this should be equal to zero. The idea is the magnetic coupling will roughly cancel out the, the electric coupling. It's not always the case. There's always some residual amount in the real world, especially when you have irregular geometries of transmission lines. But this one isn't so bad. And also notice that it has units of time per distance, seconds per meter, if you work it out. This is seconds per meter. This is unitless. My reverse crosstalk coefficient kappa sub r is equal to 1 over 4 e over c plus m over l. And this should be equal to basically delta over 2. And it is unitless. This is not going to be 0. In fact, this is the usual, usually the kind of crosstalk that, that dominates. I've got two lines that come close together. I send a signal down one. 
most of the disturbance that you're going to see is when the signal comes down is a signal on the input of line number two traveling in the opposite direction. And these have different units because the manifestation of forward crosstalk and backwards crosstalk are actually different from one another. It makes sense why they're different when you think about it, but I'll show you what I mean. So in our definitions, let me go back to our transmission line model here. So the amount of increase, and this is how I have to, to describe this. So I've got voltage 2 as a function of space and time to describe the voltage on here. Voltage 1 as a function of space and time to define the voltage on this bottom bar. This is going to be the one that I excite with a source. I've got some sort of V of T time varying source sending a pulse or a switch DC transient down the line. The incremental increase delta V sub 2 in the forward direction increase in forward cross talk voltage is equal to kappa sub f, my crosstalk coefficient, time the, times the length that the lines are sharing in space where they are mutually coupling, times the partial derivative with the first voltage with respect to time. Let me put the expression up for the reverse crosstalk and then we'll talk about why they look so different from one another. Increase in reverse crosstalk my delta V2 minus, that's the backwards traveling wave, is equal to my reverse crosstalk coefficient kappa sub r times 2 square root of LC times delta Z forever the more length they share in common, the bigger the amplitude of the increase we're going to see. And this is also with respect, uh, you've got to multiply the derivative with respect to time of that first total voltage on the first line. Now they look kind of similar. There's a, a difference in the, the way that we write the crosstalk coefficients. This is unitless, this is seconds per meter. Their manifestations on the line are actually very different from one another. First of all, why is this the derivative of voltage, or current for that matter, and not just the straight up voltage? Yeah, that's, that's right. You, this, this gets back to Faraday's law, right? Let's say we're, there was magnetic coupling. You got magnetic flux that is shared between the, the two lines, the derivative of that flux, the time rate of change of that flux is what excites the voltage. So you get a voltage and current that has a certain waveform on line one, it's going to be the derivative of that voltage and current that shows up on line two. So that's, that's not too difficult to see why that's true. However, When you actually put probes up to the second line, something kind of interesting happens. If I put it on the, f the output side, the forward direction of line number two, and then I excite a waveform. Let's say it's a triangle waveform. And this starts traveling down the line. What's going to happen in the forward crosstalk coefficient is that the derivative of this waveform, which looks something like this, positive and then negative, that waveform will start traveling down the line and grow linearly with respect to distance. 
And when I get to the end of the line, I will measure this waveform, the derivative of the original waveform that has grown proportional to the distance that the two lines have shared together, also proportional to their crosstalk coefficient. The more coupling, the more crosstalk. We said forward crosstalk wasn't too big of a deal because in these symmetrical homogeneous geometries, this co coefficient should be minimal, but, but it could still be there, especially on the microstrip where you have inhomogeneous uh, materials. So that's how you recognize forward crosstalk. It's the derivative of the waveform that I put on the other line. Reverse crosstalk is a different scenario because think of what's happening here. If I put a scope probe here and I send this waveform down, I'm exciting the derivative on the other line, the time derivative on the other line. And so think about it. I'm a, I'm a triangle pulse, derivative, 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 derivative. My forward crosstalk mirrors and grows the derivative of that signal in this direction. As I send backwards propagating waves that are the derivative and they start adding to one another and folding up, you're literally reintegrating the pulse with respect to time. Because I'm, I'm dumping a derivative here, it starts to go this way. I'm dumping a little derivative here the next time, it starts going this way. And so I wind up in the backwards direction, the pulse essentially reintegrates itself. So you will see a copy of this thing strike the backwards direction, both at the time that this enters the line, and then an opposite polarity one when this leaves the line. Isn't that bizarre? So at zero transit times, if I have reverse crosstalk, I see a copy of this pop out the, the back side of the line. Two transit times later, when this thing takes a transit time to get down to the end, it will launch a backwards crosstalk wave that preserves its shape and also shows up here at the front. It will take a transit time to get all the way back here as well. And why? Because the, the waveform reintegrates itself, which when it's in the middle of the line is not normally a problem. If you take the derivative of this thing, you get this waveform. If you integrate this waveform, you know, most pulses, they, they basically, when you take the derivative, you knock out their DC constant, and when you integrate it again, you get zero across the whole watt waveform. It's only when it's entering and exiting the first transmission line when par part of it shows up and it doesn't cancel to zero. And that's why you see a triangle at t equals to uh, uppercase t, and then a similar one with an opposite reflection, co uh, with an opposite polarity at time equals to 2t. So there are a lot of examples of this in your book. What I really want you to know is just being able to, to recognize the difference between forward and reverse crosstalk. Forward crosstalk is well, relatively minimal. It's always the derivative of the waveform, and it grows in tandem as the waveform travels down the line. Reverse crosstalk shows up at time equal to zero when the pulse enters the line, and again, at time equals to two transit times when the pulse exits the lines, and it always looks like the copy of the pulse because it reintegrates itself over time. Two very similar mechanisms, but they manifest themselves very differently depending on which end of the coupled line you're looking at. You can take advantage of that as an engineer. Um, this is one of the ways they make uh, directional couplers. Um, you know, the fact that you're going to get two different waveforms um, on either side. So you, know, you bring in a sinusoidal waveform down a transmission line, you add a coupler to it, and if you design it at a certain resonant length, you're going to get a nice big sinusoid on one side and nothing on the other. And in that way, you can actually pick off which direction your waveform is traveling on the original transmission line without actually having to go in and disturb the, the circuit. So how's that? Any questions? Y'all ready to go out and build coupled transmission lines? Whether you want to or not, you're going to do it eventually. Yeah, Lamb. No, okay. oh. oh, that was excitement. I'm not used to seeing that in my class. Thank you. Yeah, what you got? I know in Ethernet you do uh, twisted pairs. Yeah. How does that geometry affect crosstalk? Yeah, so tri twisted pair is a very common form of transmission line. And the reason why they twist it is so that you get the two pieces of metal, one of which is your top bar and one is the bottom bar, really close to each other. So 
otherwise, if you have some space in between there, you get more fringing field and more crosstalk because the two pairs will be closer to one another. So you twist them up, and that way you can put a whole bundle of them in a sheath cable, and ah, they're relatively low crosstalk. If you really want to do a good job, you gotta you gotta um, shield the individual twisted pairs. Of course, that costs more, and, but they do make that kind of cable. Because like, I was going to ask, like, why they don't just like shield like each like individual twisted pair, but cost. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's actually. Yeah, they they do make that, and and in certain scenarios, especially long hauls, when you're t trunking a lot of analog lines yeah. over a long distance, you might want to spring the extra money for that. But they try to cut corners where they can. Yeah.